In many professional sports, it is becoming commonplace for athletes to abuse prohibited substances to boost their overall performance. This essay will discuss how stiff competition and LAX testing systems are the main cause of this problem, and the most suitable solutions are imposing heavier punishments on violators and revamping testing facilities. The main cause of this problem is the fierce competition that exists in any sports. In other words, most many professional athletes feel that they have to take substances like steroids to give themselves an advantage over other strong opponents. Another reason is the lack of strictness in testing procedures. Many athletes who take advantage of banned substances can still get off scot-free due to the holes in testing systems. For example, a high-profile mixed martial artist named John John who is notorious for using PED described how easy it was to get away with cheating in an interview in 2015. A viable solution is to heavily punish lawbreakers. If sports clubs and establishments raise the fine for using banned substances, many athletes will think twice before making attempt to cheat. Another the way to deal with this issue is to upgrade testing amenities. This will eradicate any holes existing in the system and ensure that the test result is highly accurate. For instance, after the UFC had made major investments to provide their staff with the latest testing equipment, many fighters in their organization got caught. Children should be taught by their parents about how to function as useful members of society, while others believe that sending children to educational institutions is the best way for them to study this. Although the latter opinion can be beneficial in some cases, I believe that family upbringing plays a more important role in educating children to be good parts of the community. Schools can be considered suitable places for children to learn to be good citizens. With standardized educational methods, schools can foster children's cognitive development so that they are able to contribute to society in the future. For example, Trung Vong School and Vinchul are well known for having nurtured successful alumni such as Professor Ngo Bao, Professor Nguyen Hun who have devoted their talents to the development of the country. However, these people only represent a small fraction of the total number of students attending schools, and thus sending children to schools cannot be the best method of educating them to be good members of society. Our friends at the Highlands Museum and Discovery Center in Ashland, Kentucky, asked a very good question. Why is it dark in space? That question is not as simple as it may sound. You might think that space appears dark at night because that is when our side of Earth faces away from the sun as our planet rotates on its axis every 24 hours. But what about all those other faraway suns that appear as stars in the night sky? Our own Milky Way galaxy contains over 200 billion stars, and the entire universe probably contains over 100 billion galaxies. You might suppose that that many stars would light up the night like daytime. Until the 20th century, astronomers didn't think it was even possible to count all the stars in the universe. They thought the universe went on forever. In other words, they thought the universe was infinite. Besides being very hard to imagine, the trouble with an infinite universe is that no matter where you look in the night sky, you should see a star. Stars should overlap each other in the sky like tree trunks in the middle of a very thick forest. But, if this were the case, the sky would be blazing with light. 
This problem greatly troubled astronomers and became known as Olbers paradox. A paradox is a statement that seems to disagree with itself. To try to explain the paradox, some 19th century scientists thought that dust clouds between the stars must be absorbing a So, when we talk about the polar regions, just to clarify exactly what we mean. And we have first of all the Arctic at the top of the Earth and the Antarctic at the bottom, and so the Arctic was named after the Greek word for bear. Now surprisingly it's not after the polar bears that live in the Antarctic or live in the Arctic and based on it's after the little and great bear constellations that can be seen in the sky. Now the Greek also hypothesized that there would be the Antarctic, which is how we get the name Antarctica and of course it wasn't discovered until much later on. Now these regions are opposite in many ways other than just their names and their location on the globe, and so if we look at the Arctic first of all, and the Arctic is actually ocean surrounded by land, and so you can see here this is the UK down here and this kind of Russia and then American Canada around here, and so there is a bit of land cover in our ice on the top in the Arctic, which is Greenland here and may see all this area here. Surprisingly a lot of people don't realize that this isn't actually land. The North Pole isn't on land. It's just one big ocean. In 1943, what became known as the Green Revolution began when Mexico, unable to feed its growing population, shouted for help. Within a few years, the Ford and Rockefeller Foundations founded the International Rice Research Institute in Asia, and by 1962, a new strain of rice called IR-8 was feeding people all over the world. IR-8 was the first really big modified crop to make a real impact on world hunger. In 1962 the technology did not yet exist to directly manipulate the genes of plants, and so IRA was created by carefully crossing existing varieties, selecting the best from each generation, further modifying them, and finally finding the best. Here is the power of modified crops. IR8, with no fertilizer, straight out of the box, produced five times the yield of traditional rice varieties. In optimal conditions with nitrogen, it produced 10 times the yield of traditional varieties. By 1980, IR36 resisted pests and grew fast enough to allow two crops a year instead of just one, doubling the yield. And by 1990, using more advanced genetic manipulation techniques, IR72 was outperforming even IR36. The Green Revolution saw worldwide crop yields explode from 1960 through 2000. I have said before that you can't have a civilization that doesn't have art. 
When we think about the great civilizations historically, all of them had great production of culture and art, because a society has to be able to observe itself. And the sophistication of the great civilizations with their ability to look at themselves and what allows a society to do that. Are the producers of art and culture mirror back to the core of the society? Exactly what is being produced at that moment. How people are thinking of themselves and how individuals are relating to the social structure at that time. Art is the vehicle through which we understand that. Were you to take away art, what would be that mirror? How would we see what we are about? How would we understand what was going on in Paris at the time of the Impressionists when people were learning to see in a completely different way? Pre-cinematograph appear all of these things are just emerging and here are people looking at the world in a very different way which was considered so radical at the time. The Earth's temperature is rising. And as it does, springtime phenomena, like the first bloom of flowers, are getting earlier and earlier. But rising temperatures aren't the only factor. Urban light pollution is also quickening the coming of spring. So temperature and light are really contributing to a double whammy of making everything earlier. Richard French Constant, an entomologist at the University of Exeter. He and his colleagues compiled 13 years of data from citizen scientists in the UK, who tracked the first bud burst of four common trees. Turns out, light pollution from streetlights in cities, and along roads, pushed bud burst a full week earlier. Way beyond what rising temperatures could achieve. This disruptive timing can ripple through the ecosystem. The caterpillars that feed on trees are trying to match the hatching of their eggs to the timing of bud burst. Because the caterpillars want to feed on the juiciest and least chemically protected leaves. And it's not just the caterpillars, of course, that are important. But the knock-on effect is on nesting birds, which are also trying to hatch their chicks at the same time that there's the maximum number of caterpillars. So earlier buds could ultimately affect the survival of birds, and beyond. The findings are in the proceedings of the Royal Society B. The world's becoming increasingly urbanized, and light pollution is growing, which French Constant says could trick trees into budding earlier and earlier. The importance of learning practical skills in primary school which was always debatable has now become more controversial with many people claiming that it is horses while others reject this notion. The substantial influence of this trend has sparked controversy over its potential impact in recent years. From my point of view, the latter proposition appears to be more rational. This essay will further elaborate on the negative effect of this trend and as will lead to a logical conclusion. There is a myriad of reasons which will further explain this argument but the most preponderant one stems from the fact that these days teachers do not give their proper intentions on students because taking fees is the only source for mentors nowadays so it does not matter what children learn or what not. Another factor to consider is these days the syllabus of schools and universities is so hard as well as the high level which takes much time to cover then teachers only focus on covering the important topics rather than explain properly. For instance, nowadays tutor only teaches English and other subjects instead of Punjabi because they think that this is not useful for the upcoming future of children. Thus, the teaching level changed dramatically also students only focus on important learning topics rather than use them in practical life. <laughs> 